All right, hello everyone, and welcome to data modeling. Um, so this is um, not a like required skill uh, to complete this program, but like it's a very useful skill uh, in application development. And uh, it's one you're gonna have to come across sooner or later. So maybe we can get our feet wet on it a little bit. So this is uh, application domain modeling. So every application has data um, and we generally prefer that data to be structured uh, after some fashion. And at almost any level of complexity you start seeing um, like these different pieces of data have relationships with each other. For example, we could say, oh, well, there's uh, students in this class. And then I might have more than one class. Maybe I'm uh, working with you guys and I'm working with um, other folks at Ford, and then I'm working at, with some uh, other company altogether. Maybe all of those are different classes. Okay, so we might say that these are two different models. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about, like throughout the program, how we describe maybe the attributes of these things. A student might have first name and a last name and an age and a birthday and a, a address and an email address and a, a avatar URL. So all those things might be part of the model of a student. And a quick tangent, the reason we call them models is because it's not the actual student. Like, um, like Tiffany Warren is like a very complex person with all kinds of different attributes, right? Tiffany model, T Tiffany Warren in my um, application is a name, an avatar URL, and an email address. That's all that I end up working with directly because that's the model of a student. It's not every conceivable thing that could be a part of that student. It's just what I need for that application. That's the difference between like uh, the real thing and a model of the real thing. So a class model might have a start date, um, might have a head coach might have any number of, of other qualities to it. And so where this modeling thing really comes in is how these things relate to each other. Because there's a couple different ways we could really do it, right? Let's say we were doing one-on-one -on -one lessons. So in that case, a student and a class are really the same thing. There's no concept of me teaching Matt P a different than like the class that Matt P is. If this is like piano lessons kind of thing. So in that case, we'd say these have a one-to-one -one relationship. It means they're the same thing. So the Matt P class and the Matt P student are different ways of describing the same thing. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's like we're doing right now, where um, uh, I ha the, the class has more than one student, but each student it can't be in more than one class. You can't also be in my other Ford group or my other non-Ford group or taking one-on-one -on -one lessons with me. Like you're either in this class or you're in one of those other things or you're not enrolled with me right now. So in that case, we would say one class has many students in it. So that's different than the relationship we had before where a student and a class are the same thing. And this one, they're different things, but we've described the, like, the only legal relationship that these can have. Every student is in exactly one class. A class can have more than one student in it. Last relationship 
is imagine a scenario where um, these classes are more like, oh, I'm doing a data modeling uh, course right now. I'm also doing a computer science course. I'm also doing a course on testing. You can be in none of those. You could be in one of those. You could be in all three of them. You could be in two of them. And each one of those can have multiple students in them. So in that case, we'd say that's a many-to-many -many relationship. Each class can have more than one student. Each student can be in more than one class. Those are our three primary types of relationships. Many to many, uh, which like I'm not having a stroke. Uh, this is like math notation. It's saying that uh, they're not literally the same thing. It's not being joined with itself. So you say many to many is M to N. You say this is one to many and one to one. We can describe most of the world this way. Which is wild, but we can. So we can do this with really simple stuff like this. We can also do it. Let's find some wild ERDs. Now let's do crazy ones. One to many, 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 one to many. Oh, this one's fuzzy. Is there a clearer one? It's fuzzy too. One to many. One to many, one to many, one to many. Many to many, one to many, one to many, one to many, one to one. Like, you get the idea. Uh, most things in most systems can be described in this manner. Questions there? Really? This is a pretty heady concept. Uh, <laughs> I got an entire degree in this. In the instance of the one-to-one -one relationship, mm -hmm. Um, and the example that we saw that was coming off of a one to many. So that's not going to cause any kind of a problem where we have one streaming into many streaming into student, for example, but then there's still this one to one example of student to class. It might be helpful to think about it and how you implement a one to one relationship in databases. Uh, there are two tables that share primary keys. So like a 34 in one table is exactly the same as a 34 in the other table. Very cool. More questions about this concept. I understand the concept as it as it works with tables and databases and such. Um, are you going to be able to show us an example how this would like directly apply to what we're doing? Sure. So, um, so right now I don't do a ton of relationship modeling with, um, the, uh, LMS to my sincere regret. I think that was a mistake. Um, so uh, let's say I needed to remodel the LMS. Let's think about some ways that I might do it. And this is the process that I go through pretty early on in designing an application. I try to figure out uh, what are the pieces and how do they relate to each other. So 
So I might say that a student, or in my uh, in the LMS it's learner. Okay, so that's one of the uh, entities in here. So another uh, kind of entity is uh, submission. Okay, so I want you to think real hard to yourself for a second. What is the relationship between learners and submissions? Think to yourself, I'm gonna call on someone. What relationship do these two entities have? Parnell, what do you think? A, a learner will submit submissions. But what's the relationship? We got three options. Oh, which, oh. which one of these? Um, one to many. Uh, uh, which one's the one? Uh, one learner to many submissions. Good. Because one learner can have many submissions, but each submission only has one learner. Now, we could imagine a scenario where it's that. Like, let's say your group projects. Let's say instead of each of you submitting a copy of that group project, um, more than one learner can be attached to a submission. Maybe. Remember, it's a model. It's not real life. How does the application model this? So the way that we do it right now works like that. One learner can have many submissions. And also, that's how you read. These are called crow's feet. That's how you read those. Uh, the, the mistake that I think people make when they're learning this is they'll go, one learner has many submissions, and uh, many submissions have one learner. Ergo, this is a many to many. It goes, uh, it's, you have to describe it as one on both sides. So you go, one learner has many submissions, one submission, uh, each submission has one learner. That's how that works. All right, so there's, uh, there's one relationship. Um, so then there's like uh, an evaluation. So this is me reviewing uh, a submission. That's an evaluation. So same question. What is the relationship between evaluation and either of these two things? Think to yourself. Which relationship does evaluation have? Brad, give it a shot. One to one. Okay, so that's one to one. That's saying that uh, that like these are kind of the same thing. So Brad, justify your choice. Why do you think that's the case? So each time you make a submission, there's going to be an evaluation. Mm -hmm. So for each of the individual submissions, there's an, one evaluation. Sure. And so if we, rash, if we like think all the way through this, uh, can an evaluation apply to more than one submission? No, not really. Uh, can a submission have more than one evaluation? No, not really. So I'm going to go with Brad on this. I think that's a, a pretty sound bet for a one-to-one, -one. Uh, which is awesome because one-to-ones are actually kind of rare in the wild. Um, but I think it's a pretty good example of one. All right, what about, um, so right now I'm the only person who does the evaluations, but that's not guaranteed. I'm, I'm hoping to have more people to help me out with that. So maybe there's an evaluator entity. So uh, same question, let's think through this. What is the relationship between evaluator and any of these things that exist already? Think to yourself. Sarah, give it a shot. Um, I 
think one to many. Okay. Uh, which one's one and which one's many? The evaluator is one. Cool. And then is this, this one's many? Yes. Cool. Why do you think that? Um, cause there's would technically be, uh, well, I might, well, the way that I'm thinking about it, like one evaluator that would do many evaluations. Uh -huh. And then say it the other direction. Um, evaluations that would have one evaluator. Yep. Each okay. evaluation has one evaluator. Yep. I think that's true. So I think it's a, that's a good model. So, so far, one learner can have multiple submissions, but each submission only has uh, one learner. Uh, a submission and evaluation are effectively the same thing. Um, just like submission ID number 34 uh, could reasonably share a, a key with evaluation. So that would also be evaluation number 34. You refer to the same thing. Uh, an eval one evaluator can do more than one submission or more than one evaluation. But each evaluation is only done by one evaluator. Yeah, I'm into that. So um, let's think about um, um, let's do one more. Maybe This will be a good one. So when we use inbox, those things that I send out are called prompts. So what is the relationship between prompt and the other entities here? Same thing. Think to yourself. Where does prompt fit in? I'll give you one more to maybe fill this in a little more. Um, an answer to a prompt is called a response. So think about how those two new entities fit into the rest of this equation. Blair, give it your best shot. With the prompt. Prompt would be a one-to-one -one because it would have to be related to each submission. So one-to-one uh, -one with what? With the submissions? So in this case, uh, prompt is like, I post a question on inbox. A response is like each uh, uh, learner's response to that. Totally separate from submissions. So one, sorry, one learner has one prompt. So um, think about who But the who prompt goes to prompt. all learners. The who, evaluator. The evaluator owns this prompt. They're the ones who create that. So now think through the logic. Are a prompt and an evaluator the same thing? No. Uh, is an evaluator, uh, can a prompt have more than one evaluator? Can an evaluator have more than one prompt? In your inbox, I'm pretty sure it's only one at a time, right? I think so. Yeah. So, so can an evaluator so then, have more than one prompt, like ever? No. Mm, I think I've done uh, a couple hundred. I thought they override each other and take each other's place. So it's oh, only this one. Is such a good point. Uh, so they do in the interface. They don't but in not, the database. Okay. I have so a then, record of every question I've asked you and what everybody's responses were. The interface only shows the most recent one. Okay. One evaluator can have many prompts then. Love it. 
So, uh, because yeah, each evaluator can have more than one prompt. Each prompt was only made by one evaluator. All right, so Blair, keep going. How does that relate to responses and learners and stuff? Then e if, if there's, going off of the array example, then each learner has many prompts as well. Uh, do they? Because they don't make the prompts, they make responses. True. Each individual prompt can only have one response per learner. Ooh, but like that per learner thing is where this gets tricky. So, so like, each let's prompt think can have many responses. So let, let's think about uh, just this side of it. What is the relationship between learners and responses? Over the course of all prompts one, that you might ever do, how many responses can a learner have? One for each prompt. Right. So that's more than one. So that's going to be many. All right. So each learner can have more than one response. Every response was made by a specific learner, though. All right. So now, last thing. We got to figure out the relationship between uh, responses and prompts. So Blair. Many. Each prompt can have many responses. So each prompt has many responses and every response is to only one prompt. Which tracks. You can't have a single response that goes to more than one prompt. So that's a portion of this system. That's what that data modeling process looks like. Questions so far? Could you not apply that same logic to the learner to submission to evaluation also? Because you could have many submissions or there could be, I'm just thinking if we're looking at, you can send out a bunch of submissions and everybody could submit, you know, I guess they can only submit one response for a prompt, but you can submit many submissions for the LMS. You can do a, okay, so each learner, so like you could, you say this as each, like each learner mm -hmm. has many submissions. And so that's like across all different things that you might submit. And for each of those submissions, there's only one evaluation. So you might submit three things and get three evaluations, but those would still map directly to each other. In fact, you could say that that evaluation is just a quality of the submission. I feel attacked. Um, <laughs> okay, I got you. It's like kind of like, what does it finally evaluate to? And there's going to only want to be one answer. Okay. Yes. More questions about this. Wouldn't there be a one-to-many relationship between prompts and learners? Um, how so? So for all 11 participants in here, well, all for all 10 participants in here, there could be one prompt available to provide a response. So even though it's coming in from you create the prompt, we still have to interact with it somehow. Sure. So I think that what you're thinking of is like how this gets used in the application. And that's an important distinction to make. All of this is data at rest. You can just go into the database and look at the data. No cool interface, no logic behind it, no currently posted, no none of that. These are just filing cabinets uh, full of stuff. And in fact, this process of entity relationship modeling is not particular to computers. Uh, people did this before uh, like you even computerized this kind of data storage. This is library science. Um, and uh, so you're talking about how things theoretically relate to each other, not necessarily how any particular implementation of it is. So 
learners do have a relationship with prompts um, through their responses. But a learner doesn't make a prompt directly, only evaluators do. And this is where this starts getting complicated. Anytime you see this pattern, where you're one to many here, one to many here, you could also say that exact same thing as learners have a many to many relationship with prompts. Each learner uh, can respond to more than one prompt. Each prompt can be responded to by more than one learner. So that's the, that's the real relationship. But we, you, can, you can always, 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 always take one of these many-to-many -many relationships and break it down into two one-to-many relationships. And in fact, with databases, that's what you have to do. There's no way to model a many-to-many -many relationship in a database. Have to do it as two one-to-many's. So if the one-to-many was a crow's foot, what is that called? Oh, so the crow's foot, it's just the name for this type of notation. Right. Okay. So no matter what the notation is, it's just a crow's foot. Yeah. I thought it meant it was like the the one to many. No, particular. like that okay. symbol you could call a crow's foot. Um, but really, it's just this entire notation because it's not the only one. In fact, when we were looking um, at all those, these things, uh, let's see, that's crow's foot. Um, that's not the one I'm thinking of. The other major one is called, uh, it might be that. Nope, that's crow's foot too. The other one's called chin notation. Yeah, it is that. Um, it, it does the exact same thing. It just doesn't use crow's feet. Crow speed is by far, there, this is the thing I was looking for. Um, crow's foot notation is way easier to read um, and a lot more common. I, like, I don't think anybody needs to learn Chen notation. But this way of describing relationships yeah, is called crow's foot. So yeah, we use this with databases. We can also use it with, um, yeah, just like physically filing uh, things, designing a sign-up form. Uh, anything that uh, is in your domain. Um, so like for, for my kind of work, stuff in my domain, learners, submissions, evaluators, evaluations, responses, prompts, those are all domain concepts in, in my app. Um, when I was uh, working with like a doctor and nurse training, the entities were things like um, training, booking, equipment, facilitator, like all of those were, were entities in my domain. And so then you start describing the relationships uh, between all of those. And like, it takes a little while to get the hang of. Like I said, I spent an entire four years in college doing this. So like, it's gonna take a second, but um, it's one of those things you kind of can't stop doing. <laughs> it becomes addicting and you just look around the world and it's like seeing through the matrix a little bit. You just see everything in terms of like, ah, this is an entity and it has relationships with things. Um, so how does that apply when you code it? Like, what do you do differently? Is it where you put the sure. primary keys and stuff? So let's, so that, so this is the model. Let's start talking about how we might implement such a thing. Let's go back to a simple one. So let's say so we do students in class. Um, and so you might have student class. And we might say that uh, each class has multiple students. Every student's only in one class. Easy enough. So 
uh, in JavaScript, we would probably do that something like, at the top level, you've got a class. And it has a start date. Um, and like uh, end date. And then I need to talk about the many students that the class has. So I store those as an array. And then each of those has you know, IDs and names and whatever else. So that's how we would do a one-to-many in JavaScript. You just have some property that has an array. Can't do that with databases. Um, databases don't have arrays. Um, this is also the NoSQL way of doing it. And if that sounds simpler, well, it's, <laughs> it is. It also sucks more. Um, so the way that we have to do this with relational data is with primary keys and foreign keys. So instead, you would have a table for class and it might have, let's see, an ID and a start date and an end date. Okay, so I have this record in my class table in my database there, but I don't keep the students on that. The students I keep in their own table, and they have an ID and a name and a class ID. So this is like Sarah and Lauren and Sharon. And they're all in class one. So if you've been through this part of the readings and exercises and stuff, you'll note that these are foreign keys. And these are primary keys. So we can model this exact same thing by in the student table, which that's the many side. This foreign key always, always, always goes on the many side. We just put the ID of that thing here. And from that, we can recreate this same thing. We go, oh, um, and then replace this ID with all of the stuff that's, that's part of the class tables, primary key one. If you can find that record, Sarah's start date is 3-1, Sarah's end date is 617 all the way down that is the relational way to do this stuff databases can't do this relational databases can't relational databases do this instead so if something changed and somebody like quit or whatever mm -hmm. their their end date would be different how would you modify that mm. It's a great question. So 
in that case, uh, I would probably need the, uh, to model the data differently. So, uh, because like, I can't, if I change the end date for the class, that reference, all these things that reference it all now have a different end date. So I need some other way to account for that. Um, for example, I could move start and end into the student model instead and just populate all those up front. I could say that the class starts and ends here, um, but I uh, maybe have like a separate thing in between the, uh, that's like an enrollment or maybe it's, it's even just another property here like drop date. And for some people it's null, um, but, uh, and then in my application, if a record has a drop date present, then it overrides the class end date. I could put logic in for that or something. But yeah, I would need to model the data differently to account for something like that. If that's something that needs to be tracked in my database at all. Because you could also just say, um, Sharon won the lottery, so she's not in the class anymore. Now, that's the same thing as Sharon, like, being disenrolled, basically. Could you also create a new table and do, like, an inner join? Yeah, like, but that's where these uh, relationships become important. So, okay. um, yeah, it would need to be something like... Let's say there's a class table and a student table and an enrollment table. So now we got to figure out what the relationship between these are. Uh, can a student have more than one enrollment in this case? I'm going to say no. That means that uh, and each enrollment is only specific to a single student. Ergo, a student and their enrollment are kind of the same thing. And then a class has its relationship with enrollments, not students. And so then a student might still just have their name and their email address and whatever else. But now there might also be this uh, idea of an enrollment. that has something like uh, a withdrawal date. Because like maybe I also need to account for late starts. So this might have a student ID and a class ID and a drop date. So in this one, uh, three, which is Sharon, uh, is enrolled in class one and stopped coming on 531 because she won the lottery. So now instead of class, oh, and then this would have its own ID too. Oop, come on, there we go. So now this is no longer class ID. This is enrollment ID. And then now these can't all have the same enrollment ID anymore. There needs to be one for everybody. So enrollment Two is going to be for Sarah, who is student one, 
Uh, enrollment three is going to be Lauren, who was student two. They're all enrolled here. And too bad, so sad, Sarah and Laura didn't win the lottery. So uh, they don't have uh, any entry in their drop date. So then these become... Let's see, Lauren was... Oh, actually, these, uh, the, the, the enrollment already has the student ID. I don't need to map it both ways. I, got, I could since they're like one-to-one, -one, but I don't actually need to. It can get very complicated, it looks like. You're very telling me. Like I said, this is all I studied for four years and then elected not to go on for the master's for it. But yeah, data modeling is rough, man. It's also like, like the reason I studied in school is I think it's like the most interesting thing in like all of application development. And it's the part that like, I think determines how difficult everything else in your application is to make. If you get your domain model right, like, most things are fairly easy to develop around it. If you get your domain model wrong, you end up having to do loop and conditional gymnastics around like everything that you got wrong. So we've already shown that we can attach a third table here. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of solidify it, we could do like an additional table, right? But this can keep going on and on and on as long as on we want. On and on and on. Where the foreign keys uh, are used to associate to those previous primary keys for like students' favorite clap-in songs or totally. cookies or what have you. Go on. So yeah, the foreign key is always on the many side. So this, if we were doing this relational, the submission table would have a foreign key for learner. And it would be a, a, some primary key over here. So if there's learners one, two, three, four, five, and learner one is Sarah, um, uh, submission, each submission is going to have a learner ID field. And if there's a one on there, that means Sarah submitted it. So how much time would you spend on the creation of this? Like how thinking through like how to arrange it to get it right from the first start, like for the LMS, how did you go about doing that? So for the LMS, for reasons that are still not clear to me, I didn't do relational modeling. Now I said this data modeling process, I did the shit out of this. Let me see if I can track down a picture of what this looked like at one point. Um, because I thought about that for weeks. Um, that's like a good reason to have a, a whiteboard in your room is I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then I tried to, to do it non-relational. So the way that you do it non-relationally is you, um, uh, take something like, like this, and then just store that as is in your database. I regret that. I think it really negatively impacted the performance of the database. It made a lot of other things later on that should have been easy a lot harder. Um, that was just, it was just the wrong call. Um, happens to the best of us. I tried to make something simple and <laughs> I was incorrect. So let me see if I can find a whiteboard that has This was, well, let's see, that one was for the uh, content. Let's see if I can find an earlier one. No. All right, apparently this is the only one that survived. Merciful for all of us. But, um, so this is when I was trying to figure out what these relationships were. Um, I didn't actually end up doing it this way, but this was going to be like keeping track of each file 
in GitHub or like Markdown file. And then that could have a many to many relationship with vocab terms. Uh, and then that could also have a many to many relationship with tags. So I could have things that were like tagged as HTML and CSS and, you know, Angular or something like that. Um, and like its ID would be a UUID and it would have a string for a file name. And so like, yeah, like this is a very normal part of application development. And just like thinking through problems. What are the nouns in my problem? What relationships do they have with each other? The process of coming up with answers to those will yield some very useful insights. Always does. How do you decide which one is the primary? Uh, it's so uh, a primary, the primary side is the one where you would say it, one evaluator has many prompts, but each prompt is only made by one evaluator. So whatever fits that shape, that's the one side. One evaluator has many evaluations, but each evaluation only has one evaluator. So let's say I tried to say that the, the other way around. Let's say one evaluation can have many evaluators, but each evaluator only has one evaluation. That doesn't make any sense. That's how you know it's the wrong one. So if it changes over the course of something, what yeah. would you do? Would you rearrange it or? You have to remodel it. Um, okay. And that, that's a nightmare. That is. That is like a worst case scenario in an app. So of course, happens all the time. Cause like, there's no way, there's no way that, let's say I, I use this app for the next 10 years. The chances that like, I get this exact model for how I want to use this app for the next 10 years, right? The first time, no fucking way. And so what you have to do though, is like the rest of your app still depends on all of this stuff that you modeled a fairly particular way. Uh, so if you change it, you need to do a couple things. You need to change those database tables, like you're changing the structure of the database. So there are tools for doing that. Um, the, the process is called migration. You're migrating one era of a database to a different era of a database. So anytime you're adding a table, changing a column, changing relationships and stuff, those are migrations. Um, because you need to have like a very precise way that you say, take this database from this structure to this structure. Because that also might involve, um, you need to move data between tables. So you need some way to describe how that happens. And like, that can be a scary thing to do, especially if you're doing that with production data. Anytime that data starts moving around, there's a chance that you lose it. So um, you need to do that. And then all of the things that depend on that database, like your Spring Boot services, those need to get updated to reflect your new structure. Uh, your controllers that use those services, those need to get updated. Um, and then your application that's consuming this stuff. Now, what's cool about having all of this separation and all these different steps, especially on the API side, is it's possible that we rework all this database stuff, but we don't actually change the structure of what comes back from the API. Maybe it didn't need to. Maybe the only thing that needed to change was how it's actually stored in the database. Like, that's probably going to be the case for my uh, LMS data. Like, I'm actually quite happy with how I use it. I'm not happy with how I store it. It makes it hard to report on. It makes it hard to um, improve performance on. But I actually think it's just fine how it comes out of the API. So uh, that's a lot less things that I need to change and touch. I need to do those migrations. I need to move this stuff around in the database. Uh, the equivalent of my services, I need to change how those work. Nothing else necessarily does. So... That's that process. Um, would you say that like every resource um, is like one table, like one table to resource and vice versa? Yes, those aren't actually 
like the same thing and they refer to slightly different concepts. Um, 99% of the time they overlap totally though. Table, entity, resource, like in, in Barkwire, all three of those are dogs. Or rather a dog is going to be a model. It's going to be an entity. It's going to be a table. It's going to be a resource. So like there's a lot of cases where all those things just stack right on top of each other. Now, that's not a universal truth though. And like, for example, you could make a decent case that like in this, where we added this enrollment thing here, that enrollment is a table, is, is a model, because we're like using it model wise here, but is not necessarily exposed on the API. So it's not a resource. Like that's where this stuff starts getting a little bit tricky. You could also make an argument that it's not an entity because it's wholly dependent on these other things. Like I said, I studied this for a long time, so it, it starts it starts getting wonky quickly. But I think for y'all, it's perfectly fine to think about like entity, resource, table. They're all just different ways of describing the same thing. Would trying to shoehorn something in between, uh, let's say, evaluator and prompt, for example, be similar to migrating and just as difficult? Or yes. would that kind of forcing an implement? Oh, it would be. Yeah. So, like, this is called a model because, like, we're just talking about nouns and their relationships. Um, very abstractly. We're not even talking about computers necessarily with this. So when we start talking about how we implement this in a database, the diagram looks exactly the same. It just has like the things that are on those tables. So that would be something like the evaluator table has a primary key of ID and uh, an email address and the prompt since it's on the many side, well, everything's got a key. It's also going to have a foreign key for like evaluator ID. And then it's going to have like whatever the content of the prompt was. And so that's the foreign key, that's the primary key. So we have that relationship. And so like that directly maps to how the, um, the database works. So these actually have different names. That's called an ERD or Entity Relationship Diagram. This is technically called a schema. So we like you don't migrate models, you migrate schemas. And yeah, it's like almost always a nightmare. <laughs> you update a model, you migrate a schema. More questions. So in every other iteration of the program that I've done, uh, we've spent a shit ton of time on data modeling. Uh, instead of all that, like we got problem solving and testing. Uh, I think I made the right call. Uh, this is a very dense uh, topic and it's cool. And uh, I would love to just keep spinning the wheel for <laughs> anybody that wants to keep learning about it. And I imagine that um, a lot of capstones are probably gonna benefit from at least some relationships. It doesn't even, I was gonna say even, this is a fairly complicated relationship. Doesn't need to be like that. It can be more like 
just this or just this. Um, so we can keep talking about it. We can talk about how we model this in Spring Boot. It's not that bad. Um, but um, yeah, like I, I, like you're not probably going to come out of the program as a super strong domain modeler. It's something you can pick up over time. Cool. I hope that was fun and informative. Uh, all right, uh, you can hang out here.